Good day, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm delighted to be doing this conversation with two of Stern's best known and most engaging faculty members, neither of whom needs much introduction, but let me provide a few words anyway. The first is Scott Galloway, Professor of Marketing here at the Stern School of Business and a serial entrepreneur who has founded nine companies and in his spare time is also a best-selling author and has served on the board of directors for many companies, including the New York Times and Urban Outfitters, and also the Berkeley Haas School of Business. Also with us today, my colleague of nearly three decades from the finance department, David Yermak, one of our most innovative faculty members here at Stern. David is the professor of finance and business transformation, as well as being chair of the finance department, and director of the NYU Polak Center for Law and Business. David, as I said, is a very innovative teacher and is always looking forward to what topics are going to affect the world of finance. He offered what was, to my knowledge, the first course on blockchain, Bitcoin, and cryptocurrencies uh, in any business school, perhaps in any school. This was in 2014, nearly a decade ago. Scott and David, thank you both so much for being with us uh, today. Uh, this is going to be a conversation, so feel free to post questions to each other as we go along. Um, as we always do in these programs, we'll continue the conversation for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll turn to questions from the audience. To those of you in the audience, please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A box, and we will get to as many as we can. So with that, Scott and David, thank you again. And let me get the show underway with the question that's at the top of everybody's mind, Twitter. So there are many, many things one would like to talk about Elon Musk and Twitter, but Scott, let me begin with a question to you. One of the most difficult issues regulators in the world have been trying to address and social media companies have been trying to address is this trade-off between suppressing speech on the one hand and preventing disinformation on the other hand. And a major reason Musk has given for his wanting to take over Twitter is to restore free speech. From your vantage point, where do you think this whole discussion is going to end up and what do you think the future of Twitter at this point as a private company will look like? Uh, thanks, Rigo. Always, uh, always good to see you, and thanks for your continued leadership. Um, and it's, 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 uh, it's a very affirming to be in the Hollywood Squares next to David Yermak. That's a huge, that's a huge booster to my brand, and unfortunately it takes his brand down a couple notches. But anyways, I think this discussion around moderation and First Amendment is a false flag. I think when you run out of ideas and don't want to compete on your ideas, you create controversy where there doesn't need to be any. In Florida, they've created an election fraud commission. There's absolutely no evidence of any election fraud. So let's just distract people and assume there's a conspiracy. I'm on the, I was on the board of my kid's school and this ridiculous don't say gay act. I have found nowhere any evidence that we are talking to kids about sex uh, from kindergarten to the fifth grade. It's just not part of our curriculum. We've created problems where there don't need to be. And then, okay, we don't want to talk about compete on ideas. So we create this notion there's a conspiracy around free speech and moderation where we're suppressing voices from the right. Uh, first off, they got off the First Amendment kick because they read somebody reminded them that the First Amendment is that the government shall pass no law that suppresses free speech. Uh, Twitter isn't a public square, it's a private square. A private company can do whatever it wants. This has nothing to do with the First Amendment. Fox has decided to not let the squad tweet, live tweet on their screen every time uh, they air Hannity. That is not censorship. They get to decide this. That's what a media company does. A media company gets to decide what's on and what's not on the platform. In terms of moderation, OK, so and I apologize, I'm going to be profane, but I'm making a point. I wrote I tweeted going on, going on Stern alumni with heroes, Raghu Sundaram and role model David Yermak. And the first three comments I get are from Bunker Brain, 
who writes, you're fucking dumb as shit. Echo714 writes, tool. And the mailman15 says, yeah, you communist. Yes, communist, you can. So we have too much moderation on Twitter. It's the, it's just, you know, did anyone wake up when Elon Musk, when it looked like this deal might happen? Did anyone wake up and think, finally, I can express myself? Did anyone have that thought? What exactly does Mr. Musk want to say on Twitter that he hasn't said already? He's posted Hitler memes. He's accused an innocent man of being a pedophile. He's committed blatant securities fraud. He recently, just yesterday, insulted the chief legal counsel of the company, a woman, and look at the hate. I mean, the hate and harassment she is getting in her feed, but we need less moderation. If you want the Wild West, the dissenter's voice is important. But if you want to put on anti-vax information on Twitter, I think you should have that right. What's dangerous is when bots and the algorithm are financially motivated to promote that content beyond the exposure it would get organically. And that's what happens with this novel, which is false information. It gets unnaturally elevated because there's a very unfortunate profit incentive. So if you want a Wild West, go to 4chan, which gets 20 million users a month. Twitter gets 200 million a day. Twitter is successful because of moderation not despite it. So I find this I find this conversation around free speech and moderation a false flag from people you can't get to silence and who get more attention than anybody. So I find it all just a distraction, a weapon of mass distraction from the very real problems. We're not talking about Ukraine. We're not talking about abortion clinics being shut down in Kentucky. We're talking about Elon Musk's misadventure and free speech, which I find is just nothing but an entirely false flag. I think this is BS of the highest order. Sorry, so what do you think uh, Musk's motive in getting into this whole thing is? From the time he bought up 9% of Twitter to the making the public offer to focusing I, the discussion around speech. Well, it's like, you, you dislike the things in other people the most you see in yourself. I'm a narcissist desperate for fame and affirmation, and he makes me feel humble. I think he would rather, I think he doesn't care why he's in the news. I think he's like Trump. I think he just needs to be in the news every 48 hours. And the idea of going on the board and being silenced by Reg D and the, you know, the, 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 the silencing or the, the basic decorum of corporate governance, we can't speak, was unthinkable for him. So I, I, I don't think it matters why he's in the news. I think he can mock someone's physical appearance. Uh, I, I just think he has a pathological need to be in the news every 48 hours. And we were talking about Mike, I don't think this is going to close. I think he'd rather see the deal not close if he's out of the news too long because it'll make news. So I think I don't think he's in this for First Amendment. I can't see any way that he's financially in this. Maybe he wants a lack of moderation. He wants freedom from accountability for his tweets. I have no idea why he's doing this. The only thing I can figure out is this individual has a pathological need to be, not be in the news, but to be the news every 48 hours. And unfortunately, he's winning. So David, let me uh, build on Scott's point about the deal possibly not closing. This, as uh, we know from media reports, um, Musk's team didn't even do a deep financial dive into, into Twitter's finances. And the financing of the deal also requires, I forget, $12 billion of borrowing against a stock, which has fallen 18% since the initial announcement of his 9% stake. Where do you think, so talk to us a little bit about the entire, from a restructuring angle, from an m and angle, about, about the deal itself uh, and where its weaknesses and holes probably lie. Uh, thank you, Raghu. And um, without disagreeing with anything that Scott said, I taught restructuring and still teach restructuring before I got into crypto. And I think many of the alumni on the call probably are students from my course from years ago. But this is exactly the kind of event that we would be picking apart in class. And there's a concept called the private benefits of control, where certain well-known entrepreneurs buy assets really for the fun of it because they're getting some type of commercial or personal consumption stream 
And you would think about people like Richard Branson, um, Rupert Murdoch fits the model very well. Um, before he went into politics, I used to use Donald Trump as an example of such an individual. But Elon Musk is probably the single best example I've ever seen, that everything he does is fun, from space travel to electric cars. And now, you know, these are all vehicles for not only self-promotion, but being able to manipulate the public conversation around issues that are important to him. So I think he's assured himself of being in the headlines for at least the next six months while the deal is discussed and picked apart and you know, lawsuits inevitably will be filed and so forth. But ultimately, the financial logic seems to be missing from this whole thing. You know, as you pointed out, there's a high degree of leverage in this. There's simply no precedent for somebody spending $44 billion on a personal level to take a company private. And we do have a few, but only a few leverage buyouts that have been that big, but it's always consortiums of big investors, Blackstone, KKR with lots of limited partners. But this is just one individual making a $44 billion bet, which is financed by leveraging his crown jewel asset, which is the equity in the auto company. It's not just that I don't think the deal will close. I think he probably doesn't want the deal to close. He wants it for the publicity and to somehow come out of this framing himself as a casualty of a conspiracy between the regulatory state, the, um, the suppression of a certain political point of view. Um, there are so many boxes to be checked and votes to be passed and maintaining the right margins of leverage and liquidity. I just think it's a real reach that this deal will ultimately make it to the finish line and, um, and go through at least on the terms that have been negotiated so far. Raghu, you're muted. You know, if you can talk, you know, talk talk to us a little bit about the the structure of the deal itself, because I think uh, many people may not be familiar with the structure of the deal, and specifically, what aspects of it. I mean, there is the the, the leveraging of his own stock, which of course he's borrowed a lot of money on the stock apart from this deal. Uh, what else could go wrong, and what are the consequences for him, of for example, well, walking out of out, out of the deal? You know, the standard playbook in a deal like this is that you buy a stake and he bought 9%. Maybe you make an offer, but what you're really hoping for is for somebody to outbid you, You know that you're trying to put the asset into play and to essentially make a profit round trip on what you paid for your shares and what the higher bidder is, is able to pay. And you know we've seen many deals unfold. Twitter is well below its 52-week high. And I'm not saying so much that he's overpaying, but that other people may look at the asset differently than him. I agree with Scott that a lot of the success has been around being able to frame the content in a way that doesn't gravitate too far to the left or too far to the right. And I don't think for Elon Musk to come in and, and fool with the business model makes a lot of sense, that he wants a bigger media company to come in and outbid him would be my guess. So why didn't the board react uh, seek other offers? Twitter's board, you know, first said absolutely not. They, you know, they um, they put in a poison pill too. Poison pill initially, and then uh, they didn't even go for to look whether there were other buyers. Uh, I well, would dis I would disagree with that. I bet they called everybody. I mean, look at the universe of potential buyers. Really, the only I mean, right now, Musk because of his position. And his errant, unpredictable behavior is the equivalent of a human poison pill. If you're, if you're Chapek at Disney or you're Benioff at Salesforce, do you want to deal with Elon Musk? So you just think, okay, I'm out. And then the short list of companies that could, could top a $45 billion takeout private equity. I, I mean, David, correct me if I'm wrong. This is not an LBOable company. There's a billion no, dollars. No, the cash flows though. are not stable. You know, it's it's not. But I'm thinking of other social media companies. They, but you because know. of antitrust, who could buy it? Meta can't buy it. Google can't buy it. Who could buy Twitter at 45 billion right now? I mean, you, you, one by one, you go down the list. They, they either can't. Or they don't want to deal with Elon Musk. I've, I've, I've gone through this exercise myself. I mm -hmm. thought Benioff was going to be a, a white knight and step in and not buy the company, but buy 10 or 20% of it and keep the company independent. 
who can buy it? Yeah, it's financial I'm not so sure about the antitrust part. And I would also, you know, think that mainstream media, you know, even Fox might be a potential bidder. What's um, the market cap on Fox? No, that's the problem is that they, they are can't small, afford it. But some sort of stock swap could could potentially be worked out. Um, the, the only companies I saw were Salesforce, uh, Disney, uh, maybe a fintech company. But uh, I, I think your idea about payments is fascinating. I hadn't fully baked that into the opportunity here. But Google and Meta are kind of the most obvious ones. I don't think they, they, they it might get through the antitrust. So they might not get it. They might win the case. But I think there's just too many senators who are going to use this as to put everyone on DEFCON 4. I think they're, they, they just don't want to raise anyone's antennae around this stuff. I, I, I yeah. would bet they, if they did not put together a special committee and call every potential buyer, then they were, they were negligent in their duty as fiduciaries. And I, this is a sophisticated board. You can accuse them of being encephalitic. You can accuse them of not being uh, large shareholders, of not using Twitter. That's all true. But these are sophisticated fiduciaries. They immediately, I would bet, put together a special committee of the board and started calling every potential acquirer and said, hey, are you interested? And I think they got a crisp NFW back from any everybody. Well, this is what we have shareholder litigation for, you know, to, yeah. to uncover the facts of that. And I hope no one ever accuses me of being encephalitic. <laughs> <laughs> Never have to look. Okay. Yeah, but it'll be interesting what comes out in the... the let me circle sorry, back. Said. You know, Scott was teasing this issue a moment ago, and there's an issue in the crypto space about the possibility of the big social media companies issuing their own money, basically, as Facebook has already tried to do. And the reason this is taken seriously is because it's already happened in China, where Alipay and WeChat Pay were able to grow their market share in payments big enough to undermine monetary policy, you know, in the second biggest economy in the world. And so the Chinese have now launched a sovereign central bank digital mm -hmm. currency, which has moved the projects of other countries much further down the road. Now, would this happen in the Western economies? You know, would Google do this? Would, would Amazon? I think there's a number of logical companies, but as soon as Elon bought Twitter, I thought he's going to launch his own currency if he actually owns up. You know, you'd have a, a Twitter coin, a Twitter dollar, you know, whatever you want to call it. But the idea of social media companies launching stable coins requires an impresario who is willing to take the heat from the regulators in a way that Mark Zuckerberg would not. And I think that you know no one better than Elon Musk would ever step forward and take this on. So it's it's not a high probability event, but he may be looking to go into the currency business with Twitter as his vehicle. And this would allow him to pocket the seniorage if he can create more trust around the Twitter dollar than we trust the Federal Reserve. And you know maybe this would not be the median voter in the population, but certainly a certain slice of the political spectrum might gravitate toward a right-wing stablecoin. And it would be very interesting if, if this is what he has in mind. And I don't think it can be ruled out one bit because of his own personal affinity for crypto. So you, you mentioned regulators there. What, uh, so let, let's get into a bro broader topic around crypto and regulation. Um, what is the future? So you mentioned the Chinese uh, digital currency. What is the future actually? I mean, the US is now studying the issue. What do you think the future holds in this context for both private and public issued currencies? And where so, do you think regulators are going to come down on this? Yeah, the idea of private money has not been taken seriously since the time of the Civil War. You know, this is something that more or less ended with the greenback and the legal tender cases. But it is not illegal per se to issue your own money. The problem has always been to get people to adopt it and to use it. And until Bitcoin and this new technology of the decentralized blockchain arrived on the scene, there really weren't realistic paths to making this happen. But you know, we've now seen the, um, the network systems, and I would go all the way back to M-Pesa in Kenya, where 
in one country, a telecom company was able to usurp mm-hmm. most of the payment system with something that was not too different from text messaging. But this opened a lot of people's eyes. And you've now seen people realize that there are no legal barriers, at least as the law is currently written, to doing this in most countries, that ultimately the success of these projects comes down to a single word, which is trust. And I think trust in governments is much lower today than it's been in generations, maybe not at an all-time low, but you know the movements of political populism and I think the, the media vessels of places like Twitter and Fox and so forth have fed a um, lack of confidence in political leadership that cracks the door open to these kinds of projects. And um, perhaps the law can be changed, but we have an old saying in economics known as Gresham's Law that essentially amounts to the idea that the more the government tries to regulate the currency, the more counterproductive, you know, that ultimately governments have to behave in a trustworthy way as well. It's fascinating to see all this stuff playing out in front of our eyes. And the Chinese have already lost the first round of this game where people decided they trusted Jack Ma more than they trusted the great dictators in the, um, you know, in the temple and so forth in the Forbidden so, City. Uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting that, you know, the Edelman Trust Barometer, I don't know if you follow this, but they do this uh, across several countries, they do the trustworthiness of institutions. And in the US, the most trustworthy, the bottom is government. And the most trustworthy, which is not like a very high rating, is actually private business. Uh, so uh, yeah, I don't know how seriously one can take that that barometer. I, I was here. hoping it was going to be research universities, but I guess yeah. not. No, so universities come in third behind NGOs and uh, private industry. And uh, okay. so we're not, not bad. <laughs> we're ahead of government, at least. <laughs> you know, there is something. Actually, we're going, the government's the most trusted organization. You just have to be holding a gun. The military's number one, Amazon's number two. So that's in Gallup's uh, most respected professions uh, the military and uh, uh, nurses and doctors always come out on top. The only com- commonality is politicians always come out at the bottom. In, in in both in both uh, lists, um, I'm sorry, I was getting uh, getting a little bit uh, off topic, but I wanted to get back to this uh, to the crypto issue. Um, so this is to both of you, uh, David. You've been teaching a course on this for. I mean, you were offered the first course on this in any any business school, to my knowledge. For and we had our first conversation about this, you and I, I think in 2015 or 14, 15, something like that around the possible uses of blockchain and the many things that blockchain could do. We are in 2022 and we are still talking about the many things blockchain could do. There were very few things that one can point to that, that here is something that area that is revolutionized. In We were talking of overstock.com's issue, for example, uh, uh, seasoned equity offering in, in 2000, was it 15, 16, something like that. Not, none of that has actually changed any industry. So this is to both of you. What, how long do you think we're going to continue talking about the potential of blockchain versus the actual reality of blockchain? Yeah, you know, I think people are misinformed, Raghu, because there is already a migration underway in a lot of financial settings. You're really talking about the technology of accounting. <laughs> And mm-hmm. the last breakthrough in accounting was double entry bookkeeping 700 years ago. And this is um, an improvement on that. And you've surely seen stories like JP Morgan planning to spend $12 billion on upgrade. You know, that's that's your blockchain right there. Mm-hmm. But you see in um, areas like supply chain and shipping and logistics, um, Maersk is tracking the containerized freight all over the world on blockchains. And it's, you know, very banal applications like getting stuff through customs quicker, um, resolving disputes between people who've issued letters of credit and people who think the truck didn't arrive on time. There's actually hundreds of billions of dollars of capital that can be freed up from using this. And anyone but, uh, who's job David, is, I think this was the earliest, one of the earliest transactions was also around 2015 was that shipment of cotton from Right. Australia to Texas, it, was it? Or it got there in twice, letters of credit. twice as fast. Yes, so you, but I'm saying that this is seven years later. And, and so are you, maybe 
you know the effect is uh, is going unnoticed but you're saying that there's actually a significant effect yeah you know, we had it yes i think it is very significant in you know industries like healthcare i think the the public sector is probably the biggest application because governments keep more databases than anything but we had a guest speaker um just last week jonathan levin from chain analysis who showed the rate of adoption of new technologies over the last 100 years and he looked at things like the automobile the refrigerator the television then the internet the desktop computer the cell phone and the uptake of the blockchain has been faster than any of them and you know you you say it's been 7 years that's really not very long in the history of innovation given how how far and how quickly this has come um many of these companies can't throw a switch and do this overnight and regulators have to catch up but i can tell you that enrollments in our courses and recruiters for jobs in this area you know all these statistics are ticking up and not a bad time to mention that we've launched a whole degree now you know the the new masters in fintech that is mm-hmm. catering to this market because we see the opportunity as a school so mm-hmm. i think there's there's huge demand for specialists in this area but most of them are solving problems that are not particularly glamorous you know connected to record keeping <laughs> improving the precision and accuracy of data so that people can trust it more than they mm-hmm. already do and the value of that is immense and you know this is um it, oh, actually, a, i don't uh, yeah. i don't i don't dispute any of that i mean in things like property transactions for example the type you know and other things undoubtedly um you know this might end up being one of the perfect example of amara's law you know you know amara's law right it says no the effects of technology are vastly overhyped in the short term and vastly underestimated in the long term mm-hmm. so technological change sounds and, about right, right. Yeah. yeah i i would argue today this has been a lot of icing and not a lot of cake i just come back to in 7 years after the netscape browser i could look at how the i was using the web uh how it was <laughs> you know i was browsing the web i was buying things online uh, i was it, i have trouble figuring out any day how other than it me writing about it or me speculating on it how it is actually impacting my life and i have trouble finding any fortune 500 company unless i talk to david that is really leveraging or finding efficiencies from the blockchain and it sounds like there's more out there i'm just naive to it yeah Now, like I mean, the walmart f- food trust you know produce application yep. carrefour is doing something very similar in europe yep um but a lot of this stuff is meant to be completely transparent to the end user but and there um, would be let me there would be it's impossible to imagine that there won't be remarkable innovation coming out of this by sheer by sheer force of capital if you invested this much human and financial capital in cheese you would find out that really cheese could cheese. do amazing things it's just that it, it would be impossible to think we're not going to find uh, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy and that is we call it all web3 because that's exciting decentralization decentralization as far as i can tell is a bunch of people preaching decentralization decentralization such that they can centralize wealth to an even smaller group of people i've never seen an asset class more centralized in crypto when one guy can go on snl weekend update and take the price down 12% because he says it's a hustle i i think this is the exact opposite of decentralization but let's go through each of web3 and i'll give my comments i'm curious to hear dave it's it's crypto it's loosely speaking it's dows and its nfts crypto uh bitcoin is this the genius of bitcoin is they slipped into the scarcity credibility that the central bank has lost because of the massive printing of money and they've convinced us they're going to stop at 21 million coins genius the method around having to throw numbers at something and consume the electricity of norway they have they have slipped into the void of scarcity credibility that central banks have forfeited because ultimately over time politics overrides long term thinking and every fiat currency eventually fails and bitcoin's genius is slipping in and usurping that scarcity credibility a store value whatever you want to call it ethereum does seem to have some actual utility because nfts are minted is my understanding on the technology of ethereum i think there's a very strong case for ethereum i think every other coin as far as i can tell is have at it 
I love to gamble in Vegas. I take a thousand bucks. I put on a kilt. I get ridiculously drunk and I have a great time. That is buying any other coin as far as I can tell other than other than Bitcoin or Ethereum. I, I have fun, but keep in mind, it's just fun. And you might win, you might lose, but I just see it as gambling. Then there's NFTs. I'm actually quite bullish on NFTs. Young people are now meeting online. It used to be a third, a third, a third, work, friends, online. Now it's two-thirds online. And in mating, we signal. We signal that we're powerful with Ferraris or that your kids are less likely to have infection if you buy Chanel glasses that accentuate your cheekbones. And we used to signal with 1942 tequila and fast cars and ergonomically impossible shoes. Now that we're mating online, we're going to need new ways to signal online. And I think NFTs are going to be an amazing way. You're going to Ferrari or Chanel or Hermes is going to figure out a way to create NFTs that you can only use for uh, by paying them that you will then signal online. I'll have a Ferrari parked out of my my mansion or wh whatever it is in the metaverse, or I'll be able to use a Chanel coin as my logo on Twitter, whatever it might be. I think signaling is going to increasingly go online. There's a new generation of people. My son is fine spending his, alliance, his allowance on skins on Fortnite. I, our generation can't wrap our head around it. They have wrapped their head around spending money on digital goods to signal their value to their peers or to potential mates. So I'm actually very bullish on NFTs, which means I'm bullish on Ethereum. I think DAOs are really exciting. The gas fees, the transaction fees are onus right now, but the idea of being able to bring together a group of people around a sole objective, sort of like a, a more efficient special purpose vehicle. So I think Web3 is, you know, there's some exciting technologies, but to date, it feels like the blockchain has been, and the thing I don't like about it, David, is, you know, there's this what I call crypto Taliban, and that is you can't have a nuanced conversation about it. You're either with us or you're against it. I mean, you're either, I mean, there is no nuance around this dialogue. Your, yours conversation is the most nuanced. You, you talk about the hype, you talk about the potential, but if you don't say sell everything, and come rocket is replacing the US dollar, you're seen as the enemy. And I find it a very unproductive conversation and it turns people off. You know, it just strikes me that this thing, it feels like it for all the innovation over the next couple of years, we're gonna have a lot of very high profile disasters. I don't think that'll, I don't think that'll stop it because of the amount of human and financial capital going into it. But if someone were to say there's a great financial scandal coming in the next 12 months, I'd be shocked if it didn't involve uh, a, a fraud through different hardware wallets sending false signals. There's been 37 hacks in the last 38 weeks of crypto. And the regulators, as far as I can tell, David, you speak to them more frequently than I do, literally can't keep up. They're outgunned and they just they're having a really tough time figuring out how to get their arms around this. So Scott, this was interesting because you you started by saying that you couldn't see any use for the blockchain, and then began to give all these examples, especially the NFTs, of which are an item on yeah. blockchain. You know about how wonderful it is. Um, and I first heard about NFTs from my son, who told me about the NBA Top Shot. He's in the sports management program at Syracuse, and. I was really surprised when he began studying there because the entire curriculum was esports and the NFTs have you know already ascended to a pretty important role in sports collectibles and also in participation tokens where the European football teams and Formula One teams are issuing these tokens and are using them to build loyalty for the main product. I think this goes right into your field of luxury and prestige marketing, that there already is that Hermes NFT. And you wonder, do people want the purse or do they want the NFT? Are these compliments? Are they substitutes? But it's opened up a whole new space in luxury marketing that is built around social prestige and signaling, as you said. Yeah. And I think that um, this is irreversible and it raises the stakes and the skill demands on people in marketing, but opens up huge potential for these brands. I do want to circle back, though, to um, what is the genius of Bitcoin? And when you were um, running it down a little bit, you kept using the pronoun they. And the whole genius is that there is no... We they. don't know who it is. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, a, well, they are. <laughs> it's an algorithm. It, you know, there is no promoter. 
And it is the decentralization itself that is really the breakthrough and the governance by protocol that people opt into voluntarily. Um, this raises all kinds of interesting questions about politics and corporate governance and so forth. But what first attracted me to this, and we're going back you know, to 2012, 2013, was that it was in something of a stable equilibrium that you could just put out a computer program, invite people to opt into it and run it, and they would in large numbers, and it wouldn't go to a corner solution. It was actually you know, mediating transactions with an equilibrium based on supply and demand, and it has continued to do so. You know, we're now in the um, 14th year of this, of uninterrupted you know, use of the protocol and, and vast imitation and improvement from things like Ethereum and many others. I think you know, it's a very exciting time in both marketing and finance, and it's precisely because of this technology. But just, uh, just to continue the conversation, so the big advantages when crypto was supposed to have its moment, when you had inflation, when you had political instability and you didn't want to be dependent upon central governments that would make decisions for you, the ability to transfer divisible payments, political unrest, this was supposed to be crypto's big moment. And the majority of Russians are still lining up to get rubles out of ready tellers. And crypto has seen has not seen a noticeable tick up in transactions. Bitcoin is about is stable. Ethereum has gone up and down. It's up, I think, about ten or twelve percent. But this was what's happened is the middlemen that weren't supposed to exist in the world of crypto popped up, and I think made the right decision. Coinbase said, "I'm not trading with Russians," or MetaMask said, "I'm not going." That's it. We're not letting you try. The same middlemen that supposedly all of this obviates popped up and said, in addition to charging you 2.5% for transacting, we're also going to decide that anyone with a Russian IP address doesn't have access to this community. And I think that was the right decision. But this, this, this was supposed to be crypto's big moment. And it doesn't appear to have happened. I'm curious to get your thoughts. Yeah, I'm not sure. I've heard this you know, with Brexit and you know, with all kinds of other financial and political crises, that this is where crypto was supposed to come to the fore. Um, as soon as the invasion happened, where the Russians went into Ukraine, I think you know that the Ukrainian government went right to Bitcoin fundraising. And, and Airbnb. Yeah, and as well. But um, the ability for them to crowdfund weapons and yeah. safety gear and food and so forth, you know, certainly got a lot of positive attention. And the demand for this, I, I think what really speaks volumes about crypto is the way that the Chinese have found it necessary to try to evict it from China yeah. during a time where they're having you know, real financial problems between real estate and COVID. And they're, they're very worried about people turning to Bitcoin as a, as a channel of capital flight and have been very aggressively trying to suppress it. Um, whether that's going to be effective or not remains to be seen. I think well, isn't that a buy there. signal? It, it isn't every time the, the, the Chinese get angry at search or get angry at social, it's usually an enormous buy signal. The, yeah. To your point around what I've found is that to a certain extent, crypto, crudely speaking, is a reverse trust index, specifically in your central bank or your currency. And if you, I was just in Sao Paulo uh, two weeks ago, crypto convention, 11,000 people. There you and go. We did an analysis. The uh, Pew put out a study on are you excited or basically your how open you are to adopting cryptocurrency as a payment mechanism as an investment. It's entirely correlated to how severe the devaluation in your currency has been. So we think of it, I think, as innovation and speculation. They think of it as um, a ripcord to exit from a government and a currency that has been errantly violent around their quality of life. And they see it, if you're in Argentina, oh my gosh, crypto yeah. is finally here. We're no Venezuela. longer- I'm sorry, go ahead, David. Venezuela as well. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, you know, Scott, given that, again, this thing didn't exist before 2008 and started by word of mouth publicity on a cryptography bulletin board, I think it's come pretty far. Yep. And- you know, the markets are really pretty efficient. You're, you're asking, why isn't the price higher? 
And it's $40,000 for one Bitcoin, which to my mind is really pretty high. But a lot of this was baked in in advance where people, you know, for various reasons, foresaw coming problems of public finance and so forth. And we saw, you know, big rallies after the COVID lockdowns and so forth. But exactly when the timing of the public news and the movement of the price, this can be very hard in finance to untangle because expectations play a big role. And if people a year or two ago were expecting a lot of inflation, um, you know, even people like Larry Summers were putting this out on the street. And it turns out that many of them were right. So, you know, the rally in Bitcoin because of the collapse of public finance maybe should have taken place not recently, but a year ago. You know, you can have long arguments about this in finance seminars about the timing of the price moves. But the valuation, I still find extraordinarily high. But exactly what has driven it that high and when that information became apparent to people, we could debate for a long time. So let me, you know, because both of you have touched on this issue uh, of the Ukraine war, the invasion of Ukraine right now, and what is going on there. <clears throat> this is at least the first time in my memory that we've seen the financial system actually weaponized to this extent in this in the in this yeah. war. What is that going to do to finance technology? You know, as Scott said, at the immediate present, each of you gave different examples on how we are relying on the technology or not relying on it or don't have access to it. But what do you see the future of this going forward? David? I'm surprised it took so long. You're, you're correct, Raghu, that we have not seen the weaponization of finance up until now, but I've always thought that the potential to kick some of these countries off of the SWIFT network was something that should have been done in prior crises. You know, there's been many good reasons to have done this in the past. Even today, I'm reading in the Financial Times that the government is not sanctioning Putin's girlfriend. And it's like, why the hell not? You know, why, why are we holding back these weapons? And I think um, any illusion that the US currency has to be above uses that arise in foreign policy and in national defense is very naive. And it may lead to less universal use of the dollar going forward, but it may also lead to more use of it by trusted democratic open societies. And I'm more than willing to put our financial system head to head with one that is developed by the Russians and the Chinese and to see which one attracts more customers, more import export trade, more uses of reserve currency. I think this will actually be very good for the Western economies and for the U.S. economy in particular in the long run. This is overdue. Your thoughts, Scott? I've always thought that this, the, like our airspace is our invisible infrastructure. And I always thought the most powerful aircraft squadron that we don't appreciate is USD. That its acceptance as a reserve currency um, means our sanctions have real teeth. And just a comment on us not sanctioning his girlfriend, I think that's smart. I think with an enemy, unless you feel you're in a position to totally annihilate them, you always want to maintain the illusion they still have something to lose if they're not reasonable. So uh, I the think- The girlfriend's bank account. Yeah, I think that, <laughs> I think ensuring that he still has something to lose but I've always thought one of the, and it's interesting that David's point that maybe crypto and, and buttresses uh, the USD, but we used to be, you know, we're only a quarter of the world's GDP or 15% of it, and we're two thirds of reserve currency, which means the dollar punches above its weight class. And I think we enjoy enormous soft power from that on a number of levels in terms of our ability, if you can track money, and if it goes through networks you control, and I assume the NSA has access to, I'm convinced that Bitcoin is, in fact, was invented by the CIA because I'm convinced the CIA is the only organization that can keep a secret. But that's a different conversation. <laughs> but I've always thought USD, I mean, the dollar, I think we've always taken for granted just what an incredible. Was it Breton Yermak that said our currency is your problem? Uh, but it's been this incredible. Has there any is there ever been a harder form of soft power than USD? Well, this is actually a story that has about a 500 year history. And it wasn't always the dollar, you know, it was the British pound and before right. that the French franc, the Spanish galleon and so forth. 
But whichever country has been able to drive adoption of its currency has had, as you say, enormous implicit power. And for the U.S., the real question is, have we overstayed? You know, you, you can look at the sun setting after about 100 years that World War I was maybe the turning point, but now it's somebody else's turn. And most people think China would you know, step forward. But I think the U.S. can play out this for another 100 years if they're smart. I, you know, nothing lasts forever. But the competitors that we have on the horizon are not particularly impressive in terms of their ingenuity or what they have to offer other societies. And so we've had a lot of success at creating perhaps the least worst central bank, and you know, which makes it the most trusted. And I think not to use that as an instrument of diplomacy and of, frankly, national defense has been something of an omission up to now. We've always been very polite about it and you know, spoken softly and carried a big stick. But you know, when lines are crossed, um, I think it's going to be a long time before Putin invades another neighbor or anybody else. You know, I think the real audience for this is, is the Chinese with Taiwan and so forth. So let me uh, turn to audience questions for our last uh, 10 minutes. I wanted to actually ask you a question about, you know, given the, com the complexity of the issues that you've raised, whether I think Scott already expressed skepticism about this, whether regulators will even be able to catch on to what to regulate in the cryptocurrency world. And that's actually somebody has raised it as the first question. Is there any way that regulators can actually regulate the market that is coming, given that, as Scott said, they always seem to be fighting from behind to catch up with what is going on? Yeah, the decentralization is a huge problem. And I think that, frankly, is another aspect of the ingenuity of Bitcoin is how difficult it is, if not impossible, to regulate this decentralized stuff, because there's, there's nobody in charge who you can haul in and hold accountable. You can't put a computer program under arrest. So Secretary Yellen gave a speech about 10 days ago where she said a crypto stablecoin should be regulated just like the money coming out of the regular banking system. And to me, that was like saying that when the airplane is invented, we should regulate air travel the same way as railroads. And it just doesn't admit to this given the change in the technology. I think regulators have been badly underinformed about this for many years. And there's going to be a need for them to become better skilled and educated in this, but also to recognize that the limits are going to be different, that there are things that you can regulate in the legacy financial system that you'll never be able to regulate in the crypto economy. And I think that's one reason that people are going to increasingly issue cryptocurrencies, crypto securities, crypto tokens that you know they're beyond the reach of governments for things as simple as collecting tax and so forth. I don't. So uh, I, I might be projecting here because because Elon Musk has said mean things about me online and I'm a little bit hurt. So some of this is emotion. So I think the just as the U.S. dollars is invisible aircraft squadron, the most powerful cop on the beat is the algebra of deterrence. And that is regulators can't police everything. So they make high profile examples of people and it sends a very strong signal to the marketplace. They put Michael Milken in jail and that sent a very chilling effect to people who thought they were bigger than the market. And I'm not, and as far as I can tell, Elon Musk is, you know, is so far blown past every stop sign. And if I were the SEC and I were outgunned, and I had 4,000 people in a $2 billion budget and just exponentially more ground to police, I would think the smartest thing they could do is take the most obvious case of securities fraud where he has blown by, I used to be an activist investor and we took those filing disclosure deadlines really seriously. So my assumption is I no longer need to notify the SEC when I blow by 5% in a, in a public company. So if I were, if the algebra deterrence is so powerful, if someone calls someone on this call, it's alumni, a lot of people on this call probably make a lot of money and have kids at college age. If someone calls them and says, hi, I'm the sailing coach at Stanford, send me a half a million bucks and your, your kid's getting in, they're <laughs> hanging up the phone because we all saw Aunt Becky do a perp walk. That is the algebra of deterrence. I think the best use of the SEC's money right now would be to go after Hale and Hardy, all guns blazing, Elon Musk. 
because he has basically said to the market that when you're a billionaire, the rules don't really apply to you. And with one high profile case, which I think they would win, I think that he's given them unbelievable amounts of evidence. I think they would send a very strong signal to the market that believe it or not, there is a sheriff here. He's been asleep for 20 years, but there is a sheriff and he's stirring and he has a gun and he does have a code. He does have a law that he tries to uphold. So I believe this transaction is gonna close. And I think what David is not gonna close, I, I, I think what David said is perfect. The person who doesn't want this to close is Elon Musk. If, if Tesla's stock goes down 50%, I, he's in a world of hurt. He's, he's gonna go, okay, I'm gonna kill the golden goose to be in the news every 48 hours. And then I believe the SEC has to step in. I think they have to step in and say, hold on, girlfriend. There's, this is not, we are not down with how this has gone down. We'll see. But otherwise, I assume I no longer need to comply with any C regulation, or I want to know at what point of wealth am I exonerated from all SEC regulation. I would just like clarity around that. What do you think, David? You're both a lawyer and a finance professor around uh, the securities violation. Yeah, there's, you know, the issue of optimal regulation, should you make examples of a few big fish, and we could extend this to the Attorney General of New York, which is you know, pursuing a real estate case against some guy who went into politics with perhaps similar motives. But um, yeah, there are rules that he's been caught violating already. You know, the very famous tweet about financing secured when it wasn't secured, and then he agreed to a certain set of conditions that he's now trying to rescind. And I believe in this case, he passed the 10 day filing deadline without filing and he was late. And you know what exactly is the sanction for that and so forth? Um, typically it's a slap on the wrist, but if they are looking to make an example, this is certainly an opportunity to do so. So I'm gonna get back to my question earlier. So the way about regulation of, of crypto, you said there are certain things they have to accept that they simply can't regulate. So in short, you're saying that they will not be able to regulate crypto. Certainly not like securities. And um, so you know, the, what are those things that they can't, so when sovereign digital currencies come out, if private digital currencies remain, to what extent can they be regulated? And if they can't be regulated, to what extent can monetary policy even work then? Yeah, I'm just outlaw them, of course. That's a, that's it, a it's thing. a huge problem for monetary policy, and you know that's that's really why these central banks are so interested in this because you can have digital currencies that essentially nobody's in charge of except a computer program, and they can be programmed to pay certain rates of interest or to be spent only in certain locations or you know to favor certain buyers or sellers or to foreclose on assets and collateral and transfer them on blockchains and to the extent that people opt into these the legacy legal system loses control over things where it thought it was a monopolist so if i want to borrow money denominated in somebody's stablecoin and you know then people foreclose on me using a smart contract i i might be able to run into court but there's not going to be an easy way to reverse the transaction and put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And so this will either encourage or discourage different clientels from adopting it. But I don't think we're going back to the world where governments could make and change the rules at will. They're going to have to compete with the rules coming out of some of these autonomous decentralized systems. And maybe that competition will be healthy for everybody. That's interesting. Okay, uh, we are almost uh, out of time, but let me ask this last question. There's a bunch of questions around the metaverse. And I think, so let me ask Scott this question first. I'm gonna read it out. The metaverse seems to be an extension of the NFT craze. Any predictions on whether it will take off in the coming years or is it just overhyped? So uh, first, I feel like we need a common dialogue. I think of the metaverse as a three-dimensional immersive version of the web. And there are metaverses everywhere. My kids are in metaverses every day called FIFA or Fortnite or World of Warcraft. I'm in a metaverse that I'm addicted to called Twitter. Um, so there's, there are metaverses. I think we've overhyped big text role in it and we've underhyped 
the video game companies that have $120 billion franchises because they understand how to put people into these three-dimensional immersive environments. So Epic, which I think will be the biggest IPO of 2023, is effectively a, a metaverse. So I think it's here. I think it'll continue to grow. The misconceptions. Um, again, personal. I think Mark Zuckerberg is, is the most dangerous person in the world. And I think that the Oculus, the portal into his vision of the metaverse will be the biggest tech hardware failure of the last decade. 40 to 70% of the people who wear this say they feel nauseous within 15 minutes. I think it makes you look incredibly stupid. And people don't want to put anything on their face that they don't believe makes them more attractive or makes them feel closer to God. And it's like paying with a Discover card or rolling up with a Mazda. It could not make you more unattractive uh, wearing this Oculus. Now, the other component we miss is the company best set up for the metaverse is probably Apple. And that is the App Store is a collection of metaverses, 750,000. They launch 750 new universes every day. And the most underhyped tech product um, are these things. If this was just a company, AirPods, it'd be a Fortune 200 company just behind MasterCard, just ahead of Estee Lauder. The metaverse is going to be more about ears and less about eyes. It's not going to be Ready Player One or The Matrix. It's going to be more like her. And that is you're going to have this thing in your ear ambiently because people think this makes them more attractive because it signals you're part of the billion wealthiest people in the world, iOS. You have a central server that's installed, again, in the same billion people. So Apple is just so well positioned for the quote unquote metaverse. It's going to be more about audio than it is visual. And uh, I think that uh, it's through just sheer delight. I could not have planted a better Trojan horse inside of Meta than their vision of the metaverse with the Oculus. This is the portal to different metaverses. Oculus will be the biggest tech hardware failure. Metaverse will continue to grow just in a different way. It'll be more about video games, more about audio. And I'm just thrilled that uh, Meta is pursuing this strategy around, around their vision of the metaverse. It's just, I'm giddy with joy. This will, this will re return the same results as Libra or the portal. So I just, it, it makes me so happy to think thousands of people are commuting down the 280 to, to Meta to waste their lives on what will be the biggest tech hardware failure of the last 10 years. So David, one of the great things about talking to Scott is always getting these, these bold predictions. You mentioned Epic, you mentioned Oculus, one biggest IPO of 2023, one biggest failure coming. Your standpoint, your crystal ball, any predictions yeah, I, around? I'm not a grave crypto? dancer with Mark Zuckerberg. You know, I, I don't have a, a horse in this race. And what you're seeing on the metaverse is a very old idea, which is fantasy of you know, people who want to live in a world that is in somehow superior to this real world that we have to deal with when we wake up in the morning. There's there's definitely demand for this. But my prediction, and it's a little bit boring, is that the most successful companies in this space have probably not yet been launched. That you know the rate of people coming to market with completely new ideas raising the capital, taking them public at you know, very high velocity has become staggering. And it's hard enough for us to keep up in the classroom with what's happening week to week. But I think it's going to be a new market entrant, you know, just like the guy in the garage in Massachusetts destroyed the music industry with, you know, one home homemade app. I think you're going to see people innovate in this space who we have not yet identified. And so, you know, I'm not going to give any recommendations, no investment advice, but the one thing I'm comfortable with is to ex expect a lot of change, you know, new, new entry and new progress in ways that no one's quite thought of yet. Thank you both. I think we are uh, exactly at 1.30. So thank you both. It's always wonderful to see both of you. And uh, Scott, look forward to catching up with you when you're next in New York. David, look forward to seeing you around the school. And on, thank you all for tuning in also. And if you have any questions for David or Scott, uh, please feel free to send them, us, send them to us and we'll pass, pass it along to them. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye, you, David. Raghu. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Raghu. Thanks, David.